The Unshackled Waves, episode 236. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It's two weeks to go until polling day in Australia's federal election and boy, what a campaign it is turning out to be. We've had five major party candidates disendorsed due to past social media activity, with the media gunning for even more candidates. We've had vandalism of campaign advertisements and we've had Patriot activist Neil Erickson continue to make allegations against the Liberal Party. The only policy focused zone, it seems, has been the two leaders debates, which has allowed Bill Shorten to bounce back after he had a terrible start to the campaign. Early voting has commenced with 500,000 votes already being cast. The latest polls still have Labor in front, but only just. Anything could still happen in this unpredictable election. So to digest this crazy week, I'm joined once again by the senior editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry. Damien, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now let's start with a poll update because the, the polls are coming uh, thick and fast. There's I, th I think every polling company is doing one uh, once a week now. So the big one, of course, is the, the news poll in the Australian that is unchanged with the coalition at 49% two-party preferred and uh, Labor at uh, 51. Uh, interesting, the, the primaries, it has uh, the coalition at uh, 38, Labor at 36, uh, the Greens at 9, One Nation at 5, and United Australia uh, at uh, 4%. Uh, so it's it definitely seems like it's very close. And the, the Ipsos poll in the, the nine newspapers, now that is the first Ipsos poll in a month. So it, the last one was 47.53 to Labour Two Party Preferred. It's now at 48.52. Uh, so it still is uh, very close. It's definitely not going to be the Labour landslide that everyone expected it to be. It does seem that way. Um, judging by the polls, it is getting closer as uh, election day looms ahead. And I expect it to actually, you know, even maybe get to 50-50 right um, on the eve of election. It wouldn't surprise me that being the case. It's happened so many times in the past that um, as soon as election really comes around that it's, it's a dead heat. And judging by the performances, the policies and everything that's happening at the moment, I, it just doesn't surprise me that voters are really uh, disinterested and not really satisfied with either um, selection. As I mentioned in my introduction, the early voting rate has, has gone up over half a million votes cast so far. But the thing with early votes is that they tend to be the, the rusted on people who I know who I'm going to vote for, so I'm going to vote early, get it out of the way. The undecided people, they to and fro in the, in the final weeks and then come to a decision on polling day. Because I notice in all the pre-polls, they all favour the... The major parties they don't they don't they don't tend to favour sort of the the independents that that the undecided. That's right, and I think another thing is that's important um, regarding pre poll that the major parties have so many volunteers and supporters that they're guaranteed to have people um, for the you know few weeks um, leading up to election handing out at the pre poll booths, whereas for a lot of the littler um, parties or independents. Um, it, it's a lot, lot harder for them. Like some people might be working during the week and it's just harder getting people there handing out HTVs or, or maybe their paperwork isn't even ready and organised. So that do, definitely does help the majors. And um, for sure, when it comes to early voting, the people generally um, do know what, what they're doing and they just want to get it over and done with and get it out of the way. And it is very handy, um, but... At the end of the day, election day is very important because you can't really just rely on what's happening in the lead up to the election. I mean, even a day before, any sort of change or anything, any um, any bad thing that happens does or is going going to affect you in the end. Yeah, as we saw in the New South Wales election with uh, Michael Daly falling apart in the uh, part of last week. And that was because uh, the reason why Gladys was able to get over the line is because they, they didn't have 
uh, as many uh, pre-poll votes as in other states and, and federally. People made up their minds in the final week. That's right. And even um, with, with that situation there uh, that happened in the final week, even if in pre-poll, like you mentioned, it does favour the major parties, and if it was roughly a, a split of 50-50, or even if it did favour Labor a little bit than the Liberals, um, that did, you know, make or break them in the end. You know, I mean, if, if on election day the, the majority of voters um, t tended to see, you know, the Labor Party as a, um, a liability um, with, with particular issues that came about, then, you know, regardless of what pre-polling uh, suggested earlier, then that really made a big impact on election day. Well, since we last spoke, we've had the, the two leaders debate. There was the, the Channel 7 debate on 7-2 last Monday uh, night. Uh, uh, that was the journalists asking the, the questions. Most people thought, well, the audience decided that uh, Shorten uh, won uh, that debate. He, he came across, they thought, more polished. And then there was the Sky News People's Forum in Brisbane on the, the Friday evening and uh, that that was a bit more the, the, the there was a bit more rough and tumble there and there was the 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 now infamous uh, space invader moment where scott morrison walked up to bill short and looked me in the eye tell me your uh, tax policy uh how much it's going to cost and <laughs> short and walked away and said you're a space invader mate <laughs> yeah that, that was a bit of a weird sort of um off the cuff for a mark there i i find with these debates though that's very much often it does favour uh, the opposition because they're on the attack of, um, you know, and, and trying to cause this, um, this change in the electorate. But honestly, I mean, the, so many times in the past, uh, the leader debates are always given to, say, um, a Labor politician, yet when it comes to election time, then they lose the election. I mean, we've seen this so often when it, when it came to um, whether it was Tony Abbott as leader or, um, you know, in the past, that uh you know there's so much hype when when it comes to the labor leader and they say oh you, you did a much better job but election day comes and, and they lose so I, I just don't understand how these debates how important they are and, and how accurate they are really because when i have a look at them i tend to get a different notion like i'm, I'm not being biased because i don't really favor um either party i, I actually you know aren't a fan of, of either one but uh on, on the first debate especially i i watched it and i thought that morrison just did a much better job and it was very um you know sharp and you know really explained himself um his policies very well with the figures and was also able to you know continue the attack on labor for not having costings and figures and everything like that it was just amazing that they actually said that and declared that he was the winner yeah and the the audience narrowly at the people's forum said that shorten was the the winner you have to understand that these debates uh leaders have endless uh, preparation for they they often have a member of their own party pretending to be their their opponent uh, so they they prepare for every question the people's forum is a bit more unpredictable because they can ask anything that's why i think there was a bit more sort of life to to that one i thought they were both draws given that well given after the the daily moment in in new south wales that uh, i just think that both leaders you know they uh, uh, they made sure that there was no gotcha moments there was no brain fades and that that's what you really want that you just to get through it you know all your facts and figures uh, you know where to hit your opponent and then it's over and you've phew you've gotten away with it yeah yeah i mean that's what it should be about it should be just straightforward what do you believe, um, you know, needs to be done here and there on, on the particular issues at hand? Um, they shouldn't be having gotcha moments. They shouldn't be trying to, um, you know, catch people in a particular spot. It should be just simple. At the end of the day, people want to know where they stand when it comes to particular policies, uh, particular, you know, important discussion topics. And that's what it should be about. I, I just, just in the past with, with debates, you always try and, um, well, well, there always seems to be a stage where particularly they go after um, a leader on a particular issue. Like, um, for instance, they always um, 
like in this in this debate, I've always seen you know climate change being such a, a big hot topic that's been mentioned, and I just find it really odd because if you speak to the ordinary person on the street, I mean, it doesn't seem to be one of their big concerns. Yet when you always see the journalists uh, interviewing people or or even you know discussing it, it always seems to be the the hot topic of the election. You know, like uh, that it seems to be a make or break thing and. Regarding all the um, you know economics and the other important policies, it just doesn't seem to be something that that, that clearly matches up to other more important topics. Yeah, and Bill Shorten, he still can't answer the question of his uh, climate policy costings. He did an interview with Lee Sales on 7.30 on a Wednesday night, and she pressed him on it and couldn't get an answer. <laughs> she wasn't quite as aggressive as that. Jonathan Lee is like, why won't you answer the question, Mr. Shorten? You should answer it. <laughs> uh, she, but uh, she, she gave it a go. Um, but yeah, this is... Uh, this is the thing. Well, it's because uh, Shorten's defense is always, well, we have like a lot of, you know, policies that are that, that are costed and that it's hard to cost something like a, a climate given how volatile the, uh, the the economy is. But it's, it's definitely a weakness given, you know, how bold, to use a polite term, his climate policy is. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a weakness. And I think people are, are seeing through this. I mean, there's a lot of people, um, first of all, that don't believe the hype on climate change, um, you know, on an instant. But then there's also those people that do, but uh, are worried about the costings. And um, they're worried that, you know, they really don't know or, or they feel like they're being not told what exactly is going on here. I mean, if they if they have such these brilliant ideas, just come out and tell us what it's going to cost you. And, and he's always hiding from it. And the Labor Party, from history, all you have to do is see what they've done in the past. And, I mean, they, you know, with the childcare sort of, um, you know, we, we debated this uh, last week with the big four billion in childcare that came up with. And, uh, I mean, you know, the climate change issue that's going to be, you know, massive as well. Um, they don't want to say anything because it, it seems to me that it's going to easily uh, steer us back into deficit. I mean, just based on the small surplus that we do have coming up, I mean, these announcements are going to definitely put things uh, the opposite direction and, and put us back uh, in that in that state. Well, Labor had their campaign launch uh, today in, in Brisbane. Uh, the, the big new policy announcement was uh, a tax cut for small businesses if they hire under 25s and over uh, 55s or parents and carers. So obviously, uh, Labor is wanting to get the, the youth vote as much as possible, you know, the, who feel you know disadvantaged by the current uh, economic state of the, the generations. Mm. And there's sort of a over 55s are somewhat appeal to the, the boomers. But of course, the big talking point at the uh, the launch was that uh, Kevin Rudd and Julie Gillard uh, came out together to support uh, Bill Shorten, the, the man who knifed both of them, to be Prime Minister. <laughs> yeah, that was quite funny, actually. I mean, um, he, he definitely knifed them both. Yeah, they're, they're standing there in some sort of unity, which, you know, is never going to be there. Um, but this, this is what we see in the major parties. I mean, they, all, they always, whenever they go through their uh, internal conflicts, and they resolve them, then they're automatically the party that's, um, you know, the ones to trust and that they're united all of a sudden. But even though it was only, you know, not too many years ago that they were going through the same thing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just really amazing in that regards when it comes to that. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, obviously the um, the, the issue uh, with, with Rudd and Gillard, um, the, the amount of years, that they went through um, just going at it and, you know, uh, it's just amazing, really. And I know that uh, going back to the, the space invaders uh, moment mm. of the, the debate, now, a lot of commentators tried to spin that as a Mark Latham handshake moment that, you know, Scott Morrison, he, he was, you know, aggressive and trying to getting into Bill Shorten's uh, personal space and, you know, voters don't like that sort of aggression. And I noticed that uh, Labor put out a, 
a video of uh, Bill Shorten playing uh, Space Invaders in the arcade. That's been another theme of this campaign, the sort of <laughs> meme warfare, the cultural references. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it seems like they're really pulling a, a, a you know, um, a Clive Palmer when it comes to the way they're sort of marketing and, um, you know, publicising and, and trying to promote themselves, uh, trying to pull off, you know, what Clive Palmer's been doing when it comes to memes. And um, I, I think you're right, you know, like I, I think Short and really a lot of people know that he has that sort of I wouldn't call him like a, you know, your clean cut sort of, you know, family man. I mean, he, he really does come across at times as a slightly a bit, you know, um, a bit rough. And well, he yeah, well, he's divorced. Yeah. Like, he's on his second That's marriage. Right, yeah. So, like, you yeah. know, he's, he's multiple families, man. Yeah. Well, that's right, yeah. I mean, but he does have that sort of you know, bully-like sort of uh, look about him, you know. And, it, you know, it doesn't surprise me, you know, that the whole Latham thing definitely does suit him as a tag. And I think I think he just has to do the wrong thing and it can get him in hot water, I think. Well, the Liberal Party, they've been churning out the means. They had uh, first their, their Game of Thrones means, which is uh, House Labor, Labor never pays their debts. And then when the Avengers came out, they had uh, Bill Shorten, Endgame, and now, uh, given that uh, May the 4th just passed the, the Star Wars uh, day, they've had uh, Labour's uh, Depth Star, and they've also had uh, Scott Morrison in Return of the Surplus, so they're, they're getting quite a few shares on, on social media, uh, getting people talking, which is sort of what this meme warfare is designed to do, like, you know, oh, you know, they're, they're on the money there. It's it's definitely a very important um, tactic for uh, modern day social media. I mean, it, it goes there. I mean, we've seen with especially the United Australia Party how much of a following following they've been able to get just based on um, you know little video clips and memes and, and things like that. Just you know, thousands of, thousands of share. Um, you know, a little bit of a comedic sort of edge and tint to it, and it gets their message across, you know. I mean, it's definitely different to how it used to be when, when it comes to, um, you know, previous campaign tactics and so forth. But um, this, this is the new age, I guess, and, and how people try to put their message out there. But, of course, the, the big talking point of the past week was the... Uh, amount of candidates are uh, disendorsed by the major parties. Now, it's funny they always pick on, you know, One Nation for, for their candidates. And, of course, the, the week began with uh, Steve Dixon, the, the hidden camera at the strip club, where he uh, spoke in, in very crass ways uh, to a, a stripper. And uh, the, the next night on a, on a Current Affair, which was the the program that originally aired the hidden camera footage, Pauline Hanson broke down saying, I'm sick of this, I've caught this shit all the time. And mm. I, there, there's been this, like, you know, all the the NPC cuck conservatives on Sky News, it's like, oh, this is why you should never vote for One Nation or these extreme minor <laughs> parties. Look at their terrible candidates. But look at the, uh, <laughs> the candidate body count this week from the major parties with all of their embarrassments. That's exactly right. They're a lot worse. And I mean, I have to be honest here. When when I look at all the um, the particular disendorsements and everything, um, I have to say that I don't think anybody should have been disendorsed. I mean, that, that's just my position. Like, I don't care if they're Liberal or Labor people. When when it comes to um, them just airing comments that seem to be controversial, I, I just I don't buy the whole idea that these people should be shut down like that just because, you know, years ago they made a comment on social media that people, um, you know, find poli not politically correct. I mean, I... Yeah, I well, let's go... Let's go through the, the count. So there was Wayne Kernorth. He was a Labor Northern Territory Senate candidate. He was in an unwinnable position. He was revealed uh, posting online uh, that um, Jewish uh, shapeshifters controlled the world, sort of uh, David Icke type mm. conspiracy theories. Then there was uh, Jeremy Hearn, who was the Liberal candidate mm. for the seat of Isaacs in, in Melbourne. He was revealed to have made comments that uh, Muslims weren't people who should become Australian 
citizens. Then there was the candidate for mm-hmm. Wills, also in Melbourne, Peter Killen. Uh, he commented on um, Bill Mullenberg's Culture Watch uh, blog that Tim Wilson shouldn't have got liberal pre-selection because uh, he was gay and it's an unhealthy lifestyle. And if only a few more mm-hmm. uh, conservative pre-selectors had showed up in 2016 because Tim Wilson only won by two votes, then they could have stopped him getting into uh, Parliament. Then there was Jessica Whelan in Lyons in Tasmania. Uh, now just, there was first a comment where uh, it was feminists in America uh, who wanted like Sharia law, and she she made she made a comment saying like, oh, cut off their clitorises and like send them over to the Middle East. Uh, that'd be really good, Trump. Yeah. Now she used what I uh, what I call the the Chuck Fowler defence. Uh, Chuck Fowler was this. Uh, uh, New South Wales police officer who took uh, bribes and protection money and when like footage was played of him doing this he said no it's not me it was an actor <laughs> and so she said no no it was it was uh, I, it's been doctored I'm going to refer it to the police you know when someone says like no it, it's been faked like you, you know that uh, it's it, it's probably them and so then more comments of a similar nature emerged the next day and she was gone then there was luke creasy who was the labor candidate for melbourne uh, he was revealed over uh, many years back to make a number of uh sex and rape jokes uh, about women and labor party hung on hung on to him for the whole week until he uh, eventually uh, withdrew. And then there's also another can- uh, Labor candidate for Durack, uh, Sharon Morrow. She made anti-refugee comments a number of years back, and it's quite ironic that it's the Liberal Party who are pushing for her to be uh, disendorsed. Mm. Uh, there's a lot to digest there. That, that is a lot to digest. <laughs> um, but like I said before, I, I just think it's really weak for um for the parties to be disendorsing um their candidates just based on uh controversial viewpoints so uh, I, I think it's ridiculous but one thing i have to say and actually two things i will say um the first off being that this is how pauline hansen was elected and became famous i mean she was disendorsed by the liberal party uh back yeah in 19- jessica whelan she, she said yeah, she's going to yeah, run it, as an independent and the liberals could yeah. still win that seat well, that's right. I mean, this is exactly what happened here because uh, the party just, you know, was too PC and, and, you know, but she stood up and said, look, um, too bad, I'm going to run as an independent and make something of it. And, I mean, I think good on her, you know. I mean, this is how people really should see this. So I, I think it's ridiculous that these major parties um, are just... It's more evidence to say that they're making their candidates out to be robots. Mm. That's what it is. I mean, they should be allowed to have some personal sort of opinions and views. As long as they stick to the party platforms and the policies, then why shouldn't they be able to state um, personal views in how they feel about a a particular issue as long as it doesn't directly go against uh, a policy platform? Um, It it just doesn't uh, doesn't make sense to me. A second thing I have to say, um, apart from... uh, what I mentioned about Pauline and, and how the whole um, how that all happened is why is it that on um, when it comes to all these disendorsements that it tends to be that the Liberals really um, have I guess you could say cucked out um, to an extent that they've wanted to disendorse candidates that really stated things that um, most Liberal voters and even politicians would say aren't that offensive like for instance something that. Uh, is, you know, very, um, you know, whether it be critical of uh, LGBT or even, you know, of some elements of Islam. I mean, this is stuff that politicians in the Liberal Party have said before, and somehow that was enough to disendorse a candidate. Yet the Labor Party um, have kept their candidates on as long as they could. It was only, you know, like you said, a week of pressure that finally they, they got rid of him, but they were willing to keep the guy on. Even after rape jokes, you know, from uh, Luke Creasy, you know, even after, um, you know, uh, the, the other conspiracies and, and the, you know, other sentiments, things that really are more um, directly against, you know, Labor's kind of, you know, left-wing PC sort of um, um, rhetoric, you know, that they do. But, but they were willing to actually hold on to them and back them. So why was it that the Labor Party um, politicians were more um, backing up their guys, but the Liberals were willing to throw them under the bus? 
it, it, this this seems like something that you know really comes up often that the right wing are just really not standing up for principles here you know just free speech i mean that should be enough for the liberals to just look at these and think oh well who cares you know that that's their view that's what they've said in the past and it doesn't really worry us but because the media have played such a role here in making such a big concern over it they've just buckled down under pressure it's, it's ridiculous this is why probably they're they're so alarmed the the liberal party over the, the allegations that neil erickson has made he first made them on the the band uh episode 230 of the unshackled ways uh that that's when he said he was uh paid by the liberal party through a third uh, party to promote them on social media. He mentioned a secret meeting he had in Perth with Andrew Hastie and Ian Goodenough and then also talked about a another secret meeting in, in Queensland. And now Neil in that episode he like did express some extreme uh, views on uh, African immigration to Australia and so YouTube uh, removed it for, for hate speech but we sort of wondered was it uh, hate speech or hasty speech uh, uh, because one of the the responses that a Herald Sun uh, journalist uh, got uh, Anthony Galloway to questions was that um, uh, it's completely false what was the allegations made in that episode and YouTube uh, promptly removed the offensive and defamatory uh, content and Hasty was asked about it this week because yeah episode 230 it was a number of weeks ago and he, he was asked mm. and he said he wouldn't answer defamatory questions and shut it down <laughs> and then uh, Ian Goodenough uh, the other MP named by Ericsson said oh yes a brief meeting took place at uh, mm at the rally for South African farmers in, in Perth, um, but we didn't know who he was and and nothing uh, was uh, discussed. And so there was sort of conflicting accounts. Well, if it didn't happen, then why would Neil have said it in the first place? I mean, what would he be trying to gain out of this? Uh, he could have said it years ago if he wanted to, but he's, you know, come out with this uh, particular story about this meeting now i mean I, I just question why he would have said that uh, there's a lot of people in the movement that um wouldn't be surprised at um his involvement with um the liberal party especially because you saw with the victorian election he was very close uh to um were supportive of matthew guy being elected mm. um you definitely saw that he had support there and i just i just don't see what he would gain from this um to, to come out and just all of a sudden create a story that didn't happen i mean the liberal party do things like this they do have secret meetings with with certain individuals um you know and uh, it's just surprising more than anything that it, it's such a big big deal i mean this is things that happen all the time but yeah. instead of the liberal party coming out and saying look this is what we believe. This is what we, uh, as a party, want to go down and push this sort of narrative. It's all done undercover in secret, you know? Yeah, that's uh, that's the thing. They should own it, like, be proud of it. Mm. I remember when Tony Abbott was asked by Tony Jones, this was way back in 2004, have you met with Cardinal Powell recently? And Tony Abbott sort of said, oh, not that I can recall. And then uh, Tony Jones said, I believe you've had like one meeting with him and like gave the detail. And then Tony Abbott, Abbott said, I actually, now that you do mention, I did meet with Cardinal Powell. Yeah, so what? Why shouldn't I meet with Cardinal Powell? He was like, yeah, like, you yeah. know, what's so bad about having a meeting? Like, that would have been like <laughs> awesome if Hasty said, like, yeah, I did meet with Ellie. Neil Erickson, so what? Why shouldn't I meet with him? Like, that would have been such a, like, thug life response. But, but you know what? If he did that, then that would have shut down the debate and that's it. Like, I mean, as soon as you say to a journalist, as a politician, it is like this and who cares? Get over it. I mean, mm. they can't they can't say anything then. They're, that's it. They've been shut down, you know? Mm. I mean, this is what politicians have to understand. As soon as they start to um, get soft and let the journalists create the narrative... And for you to, um, you know, um, change your mind and, and, and sort of, um, you know, look weak, as soon as you look weak, they'll just step all over you. But if you was to come out and say, yep, this is what happened and, you know, who cares and that's it, they, they haven't got anything on you, you know, and, and politicians have to understand this. The, the yeah. only way to de defeat a, a journalist that is, you know, at their throats and trying to sort of step on them is to have that attitude and that automatically shuts the debate down. 
And Neil on his uh, Senator Slayer channel, he released a video detailing the secret Queensland meeting. He named uh, David Goodwin, who's a former LNP Senate candidate, as having organised the meeting. And one of the speakers there was Elliot Watson, who was a Conservative recruiter from Victoria. And again, David Goodwin said, no, I didn't invite him to this meeting. I find his views abhorrent, which is what Hasty said as well again the only reason like as hasty said like it's a defamatory question is because you're you're making it so like that this is the thing this is only a, only a scandal because you're cucking and like because they're, they're all falling over themselves to say how horrible like ericsson is like you're you're only making it like you know like worse for yourself by by like sort of helping to create the boogeyman that's right exactly right and I mean, this, this is something that I can sort of um, raise as a, a, a way to defeat the media narrative. I mean, if you look at someone um, like, for instance, Fraser Anning, he has successfully, whether you like him or hate him, successfully been able to um, be controversial and tell it as it is without having a, um, you know, the media be able to overrun him because yeah. he's never, ever stood down and even, you know, on the most controversial of issues and points that he's made, he's never backed down and said, oh, yeah, you know, I, I apologise or, I, you know, I regret yeah, saying yeah. this. Because as he does, that's it, you know, he's finished. You know? Yeah, but, yeah. If, but if you stand up for yourself, they haven't been able to, all they've been able to say is, oh, yeah, he's a bad man, you know. Uh, uh, some, you know, someone's actually said um, a bit like a, a Facebook comment that's um, like an NPC sort of thing, Oh, you know, um, bold men bad, you know, like it's like one of those things that like a really, you know, um, a really simple way of, of um, how the media think, you know, like this person is just bad and that's it. But that's all I can say. Um, yeah, his views are bad, but they can't then say, um, you know, headlines. Oh, you know, Senator, you know, regrets saying this and, you know, makes him look really weak and destroys him. And unfortunately, a lot of other minor parties in the past have gone down that way and have really suffered from it because they haven't. I mean, even when you mentioned the, the One Nation issue, um, you know, with Steve Dick Dixon and stuff, um, I mean, why was it that K-Rudd, Kevin 07, was seen as a superstar when he did it? I mean, I read articles that uh, dated back years ago when he was involved in these sort of things. And, you know, there was journalists saying, oh, all of a sudden this has made Kevin 07 look like uh, a human and, you know, and be relatable to the, to the voters. Yet this guy here is, you know, even on, you know, conservative outlets like Sky News, they called him, you know, an animal and this and that. Mm. And, you know, at the, end, at the end of the day, I mean, this is something common, I mean, you know, I don't want to sound ageist here, but, you know, it's it's a common thing for boomers to, um, you know, <laughs> to be into strip clubs. I mean, that, that's just an observation. I mean, you know, I don't want to sound narrow-minded, but it's an observation I've made. And um, I think it's going to be difficult, at least, you know, for someone of his generation to be able to find someone that is, you know, squeaky clean without any sort of history. Um, he hasn't done anything illegal. So even though it could be seen as immoral... Um, if he hasn't directly done anything that encounters the the party platform, then I, I just of it was just you know remarkable and and obviously you know there's much to be said on the whole um, you know Al Jazeera um, you know infiltrating and, and trying yeah. to take them down for years and stuff. I mean I, it's just unbelievable. I mean that's the hot story here. It's not the the big story isn't that he went to a strip club. The big story really is that um, there was this massive you know takedown of one nation i mean you know um and, and this definitely plays into the to the fact of the narrative of people of that sort of style politics whether you call them far right or you know you know center right far right whatever you call it that they are somehow the the anti-establishment and you know uh, i mean that proves it because if they weren't and you know somehow people on the left or the greens or whatever were the the, the party standing for the people and going against the elite, then why aren't they getting taken down? Why aren't, you know, um, people doing these, you know, spying investigations on them, you know? So yeah. it really does say that they were a threat and that they were trying to, you know, go after them and shut them down. And, I mean, whether it's worked or not, time will tell. I mean, sometimes these things backfire. Sometimes voters see this for what it is and it gives them a bit of publicity. And a lot of people, you know, for instance, that are One Nation voters, I would say, wouldn't care about it. They would come out and say, oh, well, he went to a strip club. Who cares? Like, who, you know, it's not a big concern. 
Um, I think if Fred Nile went to a strip club, it would be different. Hmm. But um, a One Nation candidate, I, I just don't think it's going to affect them in that way. Yeah, I mean, like One Nation, like it's a, it's a nationalist party. Like, you know, they do believe in, you know, like obviously family and that, but, you know, mm. they're not like Puritans. So it's, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, Pauline Hanson's chief of staff is James Ashby, who's gay. I mean, mm. you know, mm. it's like, it sort, of, sort of gives you an idea of sort of like, they're, they're more about national... Uh, identity mm. um but going back to you you mentioned like fraser anning like that's the reason why he's you know managed to get the traction because he's never backed down like i i remember like you know when alex mann's uh latest you know attempt to you know score something against the alt-right when he um revealed the like the, the alt-right uh history of um people connected to, to Fraser Anning, Andrew Wilson, Radimir Orban Coletti, Fraser Anning said like, well, yeah, like what they do in their private time, like, you know, that's their business. Like they do the job mm -hmm. that, you know, I want them to do, you know, what's your point? And like meeting Neil mm -hmm. and Blair is like, you know, it seemed like nice people to me. Like, you know, I'd talk to like, if they're not, you know, not nice people, like, you know, that's good enough for me. And that's right. And it shut it down straight away. I mean, mm. as soon as somebody responds in that way, what will the follow-up question be? Mm. You know, you can't, like, there's, there's nothing else that the media could say that could really go at him. I mean, that, that, that is the way to handle the media, you know, today. Time and time again, we have seen that that is the best approach, yet there's so many politicians, well, most politicians, that um, seem pressured to have to back down, and that's ultimately what destroys them. Showing weakness is what destroys you. Uh, no matter what uh, decision or position you have, it doesn't matter whether it's popular or not. If you are somebody that sticks by and has principles, then you have respect. I mean, you know, people like Anning has respect. People like Lee Rhiannon on the other side of politics, people can look at her and say, you know what? Her reviews are terrible, but you have respect for her because she is principled. You know, whereas most of the people along the middle, unfortunately, are just, you know, robot-like um you know, puppets, you know, they just don't have any particular uh, values and they don't stick by them. They're just happy to, to sway along and, and go with whatever's popular at the time. Whatever the media says is popular at the time, that's a really important one as well to mention. Uh, going back to, to Neil Erickson, who's kickstarted this uh, media store. Now, he went further later in the week, uh, claiming that he'd had a meeting with Tony Abbott in uh, Canberra and also alleged that he'd met with Matthew Guy, the, the then uh, opposition leader before the election and said he had a recording of it. And Matthew Guy said, this did not happen to the best of my knowledge. Anything else is defamatory. Then we saw Neil Erickson's online presence wiped. His YouTube channel was gone. His Gab account was gone. His personal website was gone. And so none of us have been able to, to reach him since then. His, his YouTube channel, uh, is back up, but it's got all of the, the recent videos where he's revealed all this information. Those videos are gone. And I know a lot of people on uh, like Twitter and social media are saying to Neil, come on, put up or shut up, you know, is all this true? Or, you know, you're just like taking us all uh, for a ride. As <laughs> as such, I haven't been able to get, get through to him so at the, the time of this recording. So I don't know where this is going to go. Yeah, time will tell, really, I'd say. I mean, I, like I mentioned before, I just don't see why he would say it. I, I just don't understand what say, he would get say, say, uh, What do you mean, say it? Like, like, like for him to come out and claim that um, these interviews happened and, and they didn't, like for him mm. to lie about it, I just don't understand what he would gain from that. Yeah. Um, I, I do believe him. I really do believe that these things happened. I, I just don't, don't see any situation as to why he would he would lie about it really well the reason that he says he's doing this is because he blames scott morrison for taking down his facebook page because he mm. was then starting to support fraser anning so it's it's an interesting like if it's like a hostage situation where he's like, I've got all these like, you know, recordings and like, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep them to myself as long as you give me my Facebook page back. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like sort of like Scott, Scott may just give it back to him now. It would be interesting if he had, um, definitely had recordings. Uh, 
I mean, he might be strategic here and not want to release him yet because this could really damage the Libs in the federal election. And I don't think Ericsson would want the Labor Party to win. I mean, I know, I know he would definitely be dirty on the Libs at the moment for um, for what's going on and and them, you know, trying to limit his. Uh, um, you know, his social media and all that, but I, I just don't know if he hates him enough to want to grant Labor a, an easy victory here. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a very live situation, and yeah, we're less than two weeks out from polling day, so mm -hmm. he's probably got a lot to, to think about. Now, back to the campaign trail, and there, there's been a lot of media rage at uh, candidate uh, vandalism or advertising vandalism i should say uh josh frydenberg the the treasurer who's running in the inner melbourne seat of kuyong who's uh jewish uh a poster of his was uh vandalized uh hitler mustache was drawn on him and a swastika uh was put on the on the poster and he was very upset about this saying you know this is an insult to all holocaust victims given that it's yeah. we're remembering the the holocaust during this time and you know insult to the anzacs who fought against the the nazis and i i thought the reaction to this was over the top because like vandalism of candidates advertisements billboards happens all the time and you know people mm. draw you know like hitler mustaches on like things all the time like people have been vandalizing clive palmer's billboards like for the past year 100 percent. I, I actually when it comes to the the hitler mustache i think that's the most the um most famous sort of vandalism you ever see mm. uh, when it comes to uh core flute signs I, I remember since i can remember actually regarding elections and uh, i just even as a kid i remember seeing signs that were the face with uh, Hitler moustaches, you know, and I wouldn't look at that and say, oh yeah, that person was uh, somehow, um, you know, having a having a joke here about, you know, the Holocaust or, you know, that he was anti-Semitic or anything. I mean, I, I don't buy that, you know, I, I really don't. I don't think most people would uh, would even think about that. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, they're trying to make fun of the candidate. They're not doing it because the candidate is Jewish. Um, because a lot of non-Jewish candidates are facing it as well, like you mentioned. So, and then the Hitler moustache, I mean, is a very common thing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think ultimately uh, it was a, a big blowout for nothing, really. And then there were the uh, po uh, billboards that were put out, or posters, or a big uh, artwork in uh, Warringah, uh, where Tony mm. Abbott is up against... Uh, independent Zali Stegall. Now, that uh, Warringah debate that was on Sky News, I should note now, that was, like, really entertaining. Well, the, 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 the audience there, like, they were supposedly undecided photos, but both, like, <laughs> camps, like, infiltrate them. They're all jeering and, like, uh, you know, clapping, and David Spears is like, mm. oh, come on, everybody. So, you know, things are, like, really heated up there, and there were signs uh, with uh, Abbott's head. Uh, one had cunt written on it the other one had a uh, pal uh, written on it and now to abbott's credit he doesn't you know play play the victim he doesn't say sort of poor me but just sort of says oh you know this is sort of the 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 toxicity of that like he didn't make a big deal over that get up ad where like he let like showed him letting a person drown like he said he he sort of said like you know it was tacky you know this isn't about me mm. Yeah, it's it's amazing how hard they're going against him, isn't it? I mean, uh, of of all the candidates, they're really trying to to remove him from um, from the scene, and I hope they fail. Like, I mean, regardless of whether you like Abbott or not, I mean, just the amount of money and and um, time that Get Up are putting into this, you just want to see him fail, just just as a big screw you to them, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, ex ex exactly. The, the amount of defacing and, and and putting the vandalism up of the the faces and everything, oh, I think it's ridiculous. So, I mean, that, that's I mean that's a lot worse than putting a, a you know a moustache on on a core flute. You know, I mean, this stuff he has is pretty big. You know, oh, it, it's it's a hundred percent more more of a greater deal deal than just defacing a core flute sign. And I I just don't understand the uh, who who could be behind it. Obviously, it's someone that um, has some some sort of connections with Stegall or that. You know they have connections with uh, um, Get Up or or a left wing you know group in particular that that wants to you know make fun of it. I don't know if that sort of rhetoric works though. You know I mean 
um, a lot of people would look at that and think, oh, yeah, that's a bit, you know, a bit of a dog tactic. And ultimately, I think a lot of people will reject that sort of thing. Um, whether, whether Abbott would lose that seat, uh, I mean, he's been there for so long. I, I just don't see um, an independent being able to, you know, um, be so easily able to grab that seat. Uh, I don't see it that... I really, ultimately, I just don't know. You know, I, it'll be interesting seat to watch. But uh, a lot of people are saying he's a goner already, and I, I think that's a bit, a bit, a bit of a fake sort of um, assessment to make. And then there was uh, George Hu, who's the Liberal candidate for for Hotham, which is in inner Melbourne. His uh, campaign sign was vandalised with uh, "No China" written on it because, like, based on the name, he is of Asian uh, background. And so, you know, this is given. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was the the Frydenberg Hitler moustache. This like fits into like the media's narrative that you know the far righter. Uh, infiltrating the election. With regards to the No China label, I mean, that doesn't even necessarily have to be a racist remark. That could be solely based on policy and uh, mm. and the amount of uh, Chinese influence uh, in Australia, whether it come to, you know, buying housing or, you know, uh, buying uh, farms. So I think, I think it's a bit... I mean, you have to really assume that, that they were going after his, his background. Um, a lot of people would, you know, say very anti-Chinese things um, to any candidate, you know, that, that not even Chinese in background, just be based on the amount of Chinese influence that is in this country. So I think that needs a bit of, um, a bit of looking into. But, you know, I, I just think it's, it's more of a blowout than really necessary being. Uh, I think vandalising any sort of campaign material is wrong. I think it's disgusting. Um, because ultimately, these people put in a lot of money into it. Uh, people, you know, put their heart into it. I mean, I've, I've, I've in the past been a candidate before, and I've had, you know, signs removed and all that. It, it really, it, it, it is disheartening when you see that, you know. I mean, it, it costs a lot of money running these campaigns, and the, the last thing you want to do, you're just trying to, you know, be fair and put your viewpoints out there, and then people are playing dirty behind your back. So, yeah. um, whether, it's the, whether it's the far right, though, I mean, you know, it, it tends to be, you know, the other case in general, in general, that uh, the left wing uh, are more, uh, you know, with anti-Israel and stuff than the right is. So uh, you just, you know, you just don't know with these things. You just don't know who they are, these groups. Um, and, you know, the media obviously are going to play their narrative, whatever suits them. And obviously the far right is always going to be the, 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 um, the talking point that they're going to try and sort of, um, you know, um, take down uh, and, and you know vandalize their name of the far right. So that whenever they can, they'll just say, "Oh, you know, this is this is what happens here. You know, this is what they're doing, and you know how much of effect and impact they're doing." And um, it all plays down to their narrative, unfortunately. Now, on the front page of the the Sunday Herald Sun was uh, Scott Morrison announcing tough uh, new uh, penalties for uh, Facebook uh, trolls and those who who troll uh, people playing the game Fortnite. Uh, we, now, this uh, was apparently in response to uh, sports journalist Erin Molan. Apparently, a Facebook troll said to her, "I hope your child is born uh, stillborn," and that troll got a thousand dollar fine and an eight month suspended sentence. And then. There was the the scandal recently of AFLW player uh, Ta uh, Taylor Harris. Um, the trolls attacked her, um, an image of her kicking a, a football. And like, I can't believe we're still in this place where like we, you know, take it to heart what some random Facebook troll says. Like, mm -hmm. with regard to the Aaron Molan one, yeah, like it's pretty horrific. But like, people say this stuff like on social media all the time like is this what our police should be dedicated to to fighting like you know you made like a a really like mean like comment which like you know was hurtful to somebody oh we need to get the the afp onto them like and this is the liberal party you know supposedly the yep, free yep. speech party <laughs> uh, i just couldn't believe it it's very sad and very uh scary 
that this is what it's coming down to. I mean, people just air a, uh, a comment on social media and somewhat, uh, some reason it has uh, jail term implications. It's 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 really a disgusting thing, and I think it's going to scare a lot of people. And ultimately, it's going to create an NPC culture because uh, people aren't going to be free to air uh, views that are outside of the mainstream. And I think it's healthy when there are people that uh, do question things and that do say things that are a little bit you know against the PC rhetoric because it, it shows a bit of a variety of views. And it's a, a, any healthy society would um, allow people to um, demonstrate things that um, aren't necessarily seen as, as uh, well, by government standards, uh, standards as uh, the right thing or, or you know, uh, such, such a great thing to say. But five-year jail terms just for something on social media, I mean, how is it that someone on social media somehow has such an impact on the national scene that... Um, they deserve such a penalty. I mean, we, we grew up with the notion of uh, sticks and stones, you know, like that, that old saying. And I, I just can't believe how things are going and the Liberals are really pushing this, uh, this approach. Um, it just seems to me that there, there's nothing free speech about them um, and yeah. they're not any different to the Labor Party. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, going back to the candidates who are uh, disendorsed, it seems, you know, even though Scott Morrison's supposedly a conservative, you know, you can't make mm. comments critical of Islam anymore, like post the mm. Christchurch massacre, you remember, uh, you know, Scott Morrison said, oh, my, you know, I've, I'm with the, the Muslim faith. And, you mm. know, this was a, a far right attack. And, and it seems after the marriage law postal survey you can't say anything you know like critical of like the lgbt uh, mm -hmm. agenda definitely the slippery slope or whatever has uh, shown itself and this is what people were saying during that campaign survey because um it was bound to happen you know like as soon as you start to um you know bring everyone in the fold then your views ultimately that you grew up with, that your ancestors grew up with, are going to be um, not, not being allowed to be expressed. And it's actually surprising that churches are still able to operate, <laughs> um, you know, religious institutions. And down the line, who knows whether that be the case, whether they have to be pushed underground. It's not the first time that these things have happened. Yeah. You know, when you look back at history, so yeah. it and really, you know. We've got Labor, uh, they're promising to expand... Uh, 18C, the, uh, the law against uh, free speech and the Racial Discrimination Act, they want it to include LGBT people, they want to increase funding to the Human Rights Commission to police mm. hate speech, and they want an LGBT Human Rights Commissioner. And we're sort of seeing, I know Kerry Lee Smith got banned recently for, for misgendering, uh, like if that's what Facebook's doing now, and you know, Scott Morrison's at Facebook's throat at the moment. Like you can imagine, you know, mm. what government, like a Labor government, wants to do. Yeah, I mean, Morrison really at this stage doesn't seem any different to Turnbull. And people thought with a leadership change that there would have been an element of, of difference. I mean, they knew that they weren't getting Dutton, but Morrison, nevertheless, uh, was always seen as this uh, Christian conservative, you know. Um, that was uh, more of a, a right-wing sort of uh, candidate, you know, and ultimately it hasn't changed anything in the Liberal Party. It seems like, we, without knowing Morrison was running it, that it's exactly the same as how it was at the Turnbull. I mean, this policing in speech, um, Labor to include the, the LGBT within 18C, I think that's going to get everybody implicated, to be honest. I think our, our jails are going to be over full. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to such an implementation of that, because it's very hard to not be able to talk about those issues. Like, I mean, that is very difficult with safe schools and every single element and, and thing in society that's going on. How can you not speak on um, matters of LGBT uh, within you know society? It's impossible, and that's going to definitely um, end up prosecuting a lot of people. It's it's yeah. really 
It's scary. And there was a question in the the people's forum from a Christian, like if she talked about that, like you know, how Christians were beginning to be discriminated against. Like she didn't want to talk, like you know, like single out the Israel Falau issue, but it, like it's how mm. the leaders answered it. And even Scott Morrison was like, "Oh, we need to be, you know, respectful, like in how we." Uh, f uh, how we you know speak about our faith and saying like oh we shouldn't uh, uh, tolerate religious discrimination like we uh, shouldn't uh, tolerate discrimination on sexuality or, or gender identity like he once described is for as like you know a good man and now he's you know he's a really disrespectful person well that count as um, you know the faith in itself I mean r religion and Christianity uh, doesn't say that we're supposed to have a very politically correct approach to uh, to what it says. I mean, the, the values are there in the Bible. I mean, if someone's quoting the Bible and then all of a sudden they're a bigot, um, Scott Morrison says he's a Christian, yet Israel Folau has an issue with um, particular people in society and um, then he has a crack at him. I, I don't understand how it... I mean, look, look at the... This is something that pops up actually quite often... Uh, I mean, did Jesus have a um, have that sort of attitude when he went in and, and turned tables over in the temple, um, you know, of the tax collectors and so forth? I mean, there was no such thing as this um, PC approach to religion. I mean, if someone was um, very uh, value driven and very principled, then he would basically, you know, not back down, and he would go and, um, you know, even in the past they used to get killed for it, and then people didn't back down of their views. I mean, people used to get killed just for having those views, yet Morrison is too scared even to, you know, lose, you know, his job or, or to, to get a, a little bit of heat, um, not, not even in the situation these days where you can get killed for it, but... It just shows how spineless and, and weak our politicians are. Back in the past, people used to die for their faith. And now people are too scared to even say anything because it could make their lives a little bit inconvenient. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, this is just so piss weak. And for him to really, you know, um, say that, you know, he's a true Christian and stuff, I, I just don't see it. Uh, it just baffles me, really, yeah. Well, we've mentioned Facebook a bit. They've been at it again in uh, banning right-wing personalities. The the, the latest uh, scalps were Molly Nopolis, uh, Paul Joseph Watson, and Laura Loomer. And we should uh, remember that a Facebook post the Christchurch Magica said they were going to ban users who espouse white nationalism or uh, separatism. None of those three people I mentioned are white nationalists. I mean, Milo is married to a black guy. Uh, Paul Joseph Watson, well, he, well, he, he was a, he still is a member of Alex Jones's Info Wars, which is civic nationalist and Laura Loomer is Jewish. I mean, the, the alt right, you know, they, they mock her calling her Laura Jumer. And so, like, if they're starting to crack down on people like that, then uh, you know that Facebook is, it's, it's, it's not welcoming, like, for anyone who's sort of to the right of Ben Shapiro. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, it seems to me that uh, they do this on purpose because they're, by saying that, you know, um, somebody that is a, an absolute Nazi is wrong, but everyone, you know, um, with, without those extreme uh, views are right, um, ultimately, by saying something like that, they would just uh, limit um, such a ban to only a minute percentage, whereas this, they cover a lot more people. So they'll, they'll take somebody that's fairly mainstream, just a little bit out, just a little bit out of the mainstream, and they'll say not even this person is acceptable, which means anyone to the right of them are not acceptable. And that just shuts down a whole bigger audience of people because they know that a lot of these, um, you know, Milos and types of people like that um, are essentially um, gateways. I mean, a lot of people within the nationalist movement, you know, say, oh, we don't really agree with these people, but these people are good as gateways to then our philosophies and views because um, it starts people, you know, getting red pilled on a lot of the, the issues that are very anti sort of establishment and, you know, anti globalist kind of agenda, um, you know, push for free speech and all that sort of thing. And then ultimately, when they um, focus on these for so long, then they start to get to more the hardcore stuff and they, um, you know, become more nationalistic in, in principle. Um, and 
the media and the establishment know this, and that's why if they shut down the gateway, then there's no way that then people can then get to the to the harder stuff. Um, whereas if you shut down the, some of the harder stuff, the gateway's already there and always going to be there, and then there'll always be somebody that pops up in the future and that they drift towards, which then goes towards the more nationalistic stuff. Um, so ultimately, that's their goal, I think. And it, it, there's a good uh, picture meme of a political spectrum, and it shows a tiny little dot of green in the top left corner of a political mm. spectrum that says peace, love and hope and happiness. And then the rest of the whole spectrum is covered in red and it says far right in big yeah. letters. And that's ultimately what, what the media um, want, want to point far right is. The more, the more people that can branch in together, then the more people they can attack and limit their, their uh, strict views of what is acceptable and what isn't. Uh, so let's just run through uh, who uh, these three personalities I mentioned, who they joined. So Faith Goldie, she's a uh, Canadian a nationalist personality. She was banned uh, a few weeks ago. Tommy Robinson, obviously banned from Facebook. Britain First, uh, Lad Society and Tom Saul, uh, Avi Yemeni. Uh, so yeah, they, they, they've gone through a lot and you know who knows who they're going to pull the plug on, ne on next i mean it's you, you you get the feeling that uh facebook isn't finished and uh milo he was already banned from from twitter because uh, he got into a twitter war with uh leslie jones who was the black uh female ghostbusters uh star and he also got kicked off uh patreon because he'd been a member of the uh the proud boys and uh, we also had uh, James Woods recently uh, banned uh, from Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to target anybody that slightly isn't going by the rhetoric. Uh, it, it's very scary, you know. It's not like they come out and say that it's got to do with extremism. But ultimately, what you've mentioned there, these people wouldn't be regarded as, as extremists. Um, and this, this really pushes... Um, the narrative of a, of a police sort of stating of, of, of speech and it's very scary because um, ultimately it's very narrow-minded. What is it that they want us to say on, on social media? I mean, do they just want people to be so dumb that um, all we're doing is, you know, commenting on cat videos? I mean, like, what, what do they want people ultimately to, you know, to think and to say, oh, okay, whatever the media says, you know, the, your local ABC channel, just, just you know, like and share those sort of things to the to the square, and just go by that. I mean, um, how how far are they going to go with this? It's 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 so such a scary sort of um, time to be um, you know right wing um, in Australia. You know, it really is. Uh, it, it's yeah, it's, it's it's a crazy thing, and hopefully something can change out of this. So I just, if anything, it's all it's going to do is push people further to the right and rebel against it. That's what they're going to do, because they don't want to be pushed around. Well, Milo's joined uh, Tommy, Avi, and Britain first by uh, creating a, a Telegram uh, channel. That's uh, the encrypted uh, messaging uh, service, which, which allows you to, to broadcast to your followers. So it's good that a lot of people are migrating over there. Uh, the Unshackled has had a, a channel there for, for quite a while. So it's been good to sort of see that, because it is really... I. I love Telegram. It's a great, great messaging service. And of course, there's all the other free speech, uh, social media platforms. Milo's also created a mailing list uh, as well. So uh, they, they can't uh, unperson somebody from the internet. You know, just because you're deleted off Facebook doesn't mean you, mm. you, you, don't, you don't exist. Pe people can find a way to stay, stay online. There is concerns, though, that they're going to try and shut down, down that as well because um, I think it was Frydenberg and some other liberals at one stage were talking about encryption services and they were trying to, you know... Oh, that was just to get access to messages on encrypted messaging service, like not actually mm. shut them down. Yeah, yeah, but nevertheless, it's still going to be spying. On, I mean, the whole, the whole idea with uh, an encryption service is to have a private conversation without Big Brother looking at you. Um, and if they are going to go down that route, then it defeats the whole purpose, doesn't it? Yeah, um, but Telegram channels uh, are public, so it's sort of a different feature of the other uh, service, but that's sort of a, another uh, debate. 
Um, but mm. yeah, um, it's certainly something to keep an eye on and with, you know, governments wanting to work together with Facebook and other uh, big tech, you know, who knows what sort of censorship they'll, they'll come up with next. Yep, that's right. Definitely worth keeping an eye on. I mean, we have to be in this sort of uh, industry and um, at least we can say that we're providing a, um, a different aspect of opinion to, to the mainstream narrative and we'll continue to do that as, as long as we can. <laughs> and um, if we can't do that on um, Facebook in future, we'll do it on another service. We'll do it wherever we can um, to, to get our view across because people deserve a variety of opinion on social media. They, I mean, thank God actually for social media because if it wasn't for that, then you know, brainwash the brainwashing sort of tactic of, of your, your sort of uh, your, your mainstream. I mean, that's, that's all that people would have. And only now are people starting to see different points of view. Um, so I, I think it's a, a great thing that we have this service and um, we'll continue to use it as much as we can and hope that um, more and more people like us um, come about and establish themselves. Yeah, definitely. Well, who knows what will happen with the election this week. It's been a crazy past week. Who knows what else in this, is in store. There'll, there'll be a few uh, surprises, but we'll be back again next week to uh, digest again uh, that week. And uh, yeah, and obviously we'll, we'll be doing more commentary as the, the countdown continues. Uh, definitely be good uh, looking forward to how it all plays out. And um, yeah, thanks for having me on, Tim. And that's the show for today. As is the case with every election in Australia, we'll be airing an election night live stream. However, this time it will be an Uncuckables production with XYZ and the Rational Rise. Make sure you tune in from 6pm Australian Eastern Standard Time on Saturday the 18th of May uh, when the polls close on the Uncuckables YouTube channel for our continuous coverage until all the results and reactions have come in. Make sure also that you are subscribed to the Uncuckables YouTube channel and allow notifications so not only can you tune in election night but to the regular uh, Thursday night live stream when we go on at 8.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. It is a growing in popularity of the live stream so it is not to be missed every week. As Facebook is booting off right-wing personalities at random intervals make sure you follow us on free speech social media we are on gab.ai slash the unshackled we are also on minds.com slash the underscore unshackled we also have a mewe page at mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled we also have our growing telegram channel which milo has just joined the encrypted messaging service you can find us there at t.me slash the unshackled remember that we can only continue the work that we do at The Unshackled with the financial support of you, our followers. It makes all our reporting and content possible. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled or directly via paypal.me slash The Unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. Thank you to all those who've contributed recently. It is much appreciated. We're going to air on a Monday night, so stay tuned at 9.15pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. It's XYZ Live on the Matty Rose Live channel. Until next time, thanks once again for your company. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net. And keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.